Thank you very much. I hope you can all hear me. Uh, this week is, again, the, the um, anniversary of the bombardment on Friday. Um, let me just remind you. Here is the porthole in time that's just been put onto the uh, Marine Drive commemorating the bombardment. And as it says, on the 16th of December 1914, two German warships bombarded Scarborough with over 700 shells, killing 18 people. And just to highlight that, killing 18 people, the first civilians to be killed on British soil in World War I. And I've highlighted that because I, I want to go back to that statement a little bit later in the paper. But um, what I want to talk about is events leading up to the bombardment. And it's very interesting that I'm going to be dealing with history that didn't happen. And sometimes writing the history of things that didn't happen is as important as writing the history of things that did happen. If I look back to growing up in the 1960s and the 1970s, the nuclear war that didn't happen was enormously important. The idea that destruction was four minutes away at any moment hangs over the 60s and 70s, and yet it relates to something that never occurred. But if we're going to understand those decades, I think that we have to understand the nuclear war that didn't happen. And equally, if we want to understand the 1900s and the 1910s in Britain, we have to understand the German invasion that never happened, because that hung over those decades in the same way that nuclear war did um, 50 years later. I got interested in the bombardment in 1976, and I got in touch with as many people as I could in the Northeast Coast who remembered it, and I corresponded with a lot of them and went in 1977 before I went to university and interviewed a lot of them, and I interviewed, I think, 12 people in Scarborough. And one of the things that kept cropping up was that when, the, when people realized that the loud noises were not thunder, but they were German shells, that they headed inland. And one man wrote to me, I was living in Sema village and can vividly remember the sound of the naval guns, which I originally thought was heavy thunder. However, these thoughts were soon dispelled when I saw crowds of people passing through Sema towards the wolds. Some were carrying belongings, others half-dressed, in some cases, ladies were still wearing their nightgowns. And this, is a, this was a constant theme through talking to people, leaving Scarborough, going up into, towards the moors and going up um, through Sema, because they thought it was an invasion. And we tend to see the event as being quite discreet. The German ships came, they shelled, and they left. But for people at the time, they thought it was the beginning of something. They thought it was the prelude to an invasion. And so I want to look at how that came about. And the reason that it's a puzzle is because the Germans weren't planning invasion. The Germans hadn't even planned invasion, the invasion of Britain as a theoretical exercise after the 1890s. They had no intention of, of doing such a strange thing as, as trying to cross the, the North Sea and invade but there was a widespread belief that they were. Now, a lot of that belief came through fiction. Now, historians have tended to focus on popular culture when dealing with the fear of invasion before the First World. That's quite justifiable, because there were dozens of invasion stories published. There were invasion plays, there were novels, there were short stories, there were films before the First World War. And I want to look at... Uh, Three of those, just quickly, and the first one, and probably uh, the most significant one, was um, William Lequeux's novel, The Invasion of 1910. Now, The Invasion of 1910, this is William Lequeux um, in his motor car sitting next to the, the chauffeur. This was commissioned in 1905 by Lord Northcliffe in order to demonstrate that invasion was possible. He commissioned it for his... Uh, journal, the Daily Mail, and he commissioned William Lequeux, and Lequeux drove, as he claimed, 5,000 miles in four months, surveying the invasion route, every possible invasion route for the, for the German army. And when he delivered 
the com completed text to Northcliffe, it, sa it said that Northcliffe asked for changes on the grounds that, from a circulation point of view, it was all wrong. In other words, uh, Le Cue had made uh, the German armies march through towns that um, didn't have enough Daily Mail readers in them to make it worthwhile. And so the, the story had to be restructured to go through centers of population. So this is, this is Le Cue sitting in his car. And this is the invasion map published in the Times on the 13th of March, 1906. Now, the um, uh, Northcliffe also in the Times, so here he is plugging the start of the invasion of 1910 in the, in the next day, day's issue of the Daily Mail. And if we actually look at the area just off the coast here, off, off North Yorkshire, um, there is a landing, but it's down at Hull, there are, the German army lands on the, on the Humber and heads towards Leeds. But there is a, there's a naval battle off the coast here. But interestingly, also just above Scarborough, it says threatened by cruisers. And so the idea that there were going to be German cruisers threatening the coastline is there in 1906 and in the, in the novel, The Invasion of 1910, uh, which continues to be in print right up until uh, 1914. Uh, when in fact Gaumont make, makes it into a film. So it's a story that has a, has a lot of uh, life in it. Most of the fiction about German invasions involves a landing on the East Coast on the, in East Anglia and a forced march to capture London. So Scarborough doesn't feature, I'm, I'm sorry to say, a great deal in the action in these, uh, these stories. But it does feature in one, one point in the invasion of 1910, because a very close friend of Le Cue was George Lord Beeforth, um, who you, you may know locally. Beeforth had, had built himself on the South Cliff a house called the Belvedere. And so, in a, in a rather nice little tribute to his friend, Le Cue makes the, after the German defeat, he, he gets the Kaiser, goes and stays at the Belvedere. And so, in, in the novel, is this, this little report. This report is supposed to have come from the Daily Mail. The Kaiser has, we hear, left the Belvedere at Scarborough, where he's been living incognito. A confidential report, apparently well-founded, has reached us that he embarked upon the steam trawler Morning Star at Scarborough yesterday and set out across the Dogger, with Germany, of course, as his destination. Surely he must now regret his ill-advised policy of making attack an attack upon England. Well, I hope he didn't regret his decision to uh, stay for a while in Scarborough. So that, unfortunately, that's the only reference to Scarborough in the invasion of 1910. The second invasion story I just want to look at briefly is An Englishman's Home. This is written by Guy du Maurier and opened at Wyndham's Theatre in London. This is a poster for An Englishman's Home, which uh, was reproduced. This is actually from a a souvenir postcard. And the idea of an English and home is quite the opposite of the invasion of 1910. It doesn't involve the whole country. It just looks at one household. And that household during the invasion becomes a kind of microcosm of, of the country as a whole. And here, as you can see, sitting in the chair by the fire, smoking a cigarette and reading the sporting pages is a kind of indolent young man. And Britannia is saying, you know, why aren't you training? Why aren't you off learning to fight the invader? And um, this went on at Wind Wyndham's Theatre, and this is the wicked enemy. This is Prince Yoland, captain in the Black Dragoons of Her Imperial Majesty, the Empress of the North. So um, he's not German. I don't want anybody saying that he's German, because the, th the theatre was still under the Lord Chamberlain's censorship, and the Lord Chamberlain decided that you couldn't be rude about the Germans, seeing that they were supposedly a friendly power. So the Germans had to be converted into Sarnians. And that the play, that this, the censor said that the play could only depict a supposed invasion of England by an imaginary enemy of no recognized nationality. So Prince Yoland is a Sarnian. The fact that uh, everybody knew who they were meant to be, because in the play, they, even though they have a different name, they're depicted as blonde, bull-necked, sausage-eating militarists. 
who have arrived from some country just, over, just across the North Sea. So, um, in fact, the German military attaché did complain. So, and I think, yes, here's another souvenir postcard. This is the, uh, this is the defeat, and there, and there is Prince Yolan taken aback, quite literally, as the, the, um, the British defending forces come in through the French windows. Now, a recurring feature in the invasion fiction before the First World War are the Boy Scouts. Now, the Boy Scouts, the movement took off in 1908. And the Boy Scouts practiced signaling and scouting and message carrying, all sorts of things that uh, would be useful uh, against an invasion. And, and before the First World War, a lot of local Boy Scout troops do, do take part in kind of um, activities which assume that the Germans have landed. And here's, an, here's a little postcard of um, a Boy Scout. This is a postcard from before 1914, Invasion Be Blowed. And the last fictional depiction of um, invasion that I want to just mention. And probably, if you're going to pick, if you're going to read two of the invasion stories, then read The Invasion of 1910, but also read this one, which is written by the 27-year-old P.G. Woodhouse. And Woodhouse wrote this wonderful story called The Swoop, or How Clarence Saved England. And this is Clarence, this is Clarence Chugwater, who is the Boy Scout who saves England. And the idea of Woodhouse's novel is that the Germans have landed. The Germans have um, carried out their, their long-awaited invasion. But by a bizarre coincidence, on the same day that the German army lands, the armies of eight other countries also land in Britain by, by a strange coincidence. And here is a, a, little, a little quotation. England was not me merely beneath the heel of the invader. It was beneath the heels of nine invaders. <laughs> There was barely standing room. And as he goes on to say, Germany had landed in Essex, the Russians occupied Yarmouth, the Mad Muller captured Portsmouth, the Swiss Navy bombarded Lyme Regis, the Chinese have landed at a deliberately unpronounceable Welsh watering place. Um, the army of Monaco had descended on the Firth of Clyde and Within two minutes of this disaster by Greenwich time, a boisterous band of young Turks had seized Scarborough. <laughs> At Brighton and Margate, there are Moroccan brigands have landed, and also the, uh, the warriors from the distant Isle of Boligola. And as Woodhouse says, this was a very serious state of things. Luckily, as I've, as I've suggested, um, Clarence Chugwater, the Boy Scout, manages to uh, confound them all. But unfortunately, as I say, most invasions take place in the, in the south, southeast. And so this is the only one I know before the First World War where young Turks landed in Scarborough. Now, many of the pre-war stories about invasion involve German spies helping to plan it or acting as guides to the invading forces. And this tended to throw a lot of attention onto the German colony in Britain. By 1914, there were around 50,000 German and Austrian men living in Britain and 25,000 women. A large number of the men worked in catering and hospitality, and it was a recurring motif in invasion and spy fiction that German waiters were all spies. And um, even if they told you they were Swiss, you, you were told not to believe it. They were definitely German spies. And Le Cue, William Le Cue returns to this in, a, in a, a novel, a series of short stories called Spies of the Kaiser Plotting the Downfall of England in March 1909. And here in advertising for March for Spies of the Kaiser is the same German. Here he is as an officer in a crack German regiment. And here he is as a waiter spy in Britain. So this is, the, this is the German officer who brings you your drinks in your club or in the hotel and listens to your, to your conversations. So there's a great deal of suspicion about the German colony in Britain. Um, luckily, I will just drop in here, luckily we have Punch, uh, the humorous magazine, to, to give a slightly different view of this. Um, 
It says, Punch in December 1910. As everyone now knows, there's not a German waiter or a clerk in London or England today that is not an active spy and a soldier in the service of his fatherland, only waiting for the moment to rise and strike. The interval that occurs between the ordering of your chop at a restaurant and its tardy appearance is not due to any defect in the kitchen, but to allow time for the waiter to make a full note for the Berlin War Office as to your appearance and probable fighting weight. Now, the, um, the fear of resident Germans was not just that they would steal secrets. The fact was that um, the, uh, the conservative right in Britain wanted a compulsory military service, and the Liberal Party that was in power resisted that. So the idea grew up that because the Germans had compulsive, compulsory military service, that every German man of military age in Britain was a trained reservist. And that meant that they were ready to take orders from Berlin. And that they were going to be able to assist the invasion when it came. So when the German army landed, they would be assisted by a large number of trained German reservists always, already present in Britain. One writer in 1907 explained the German project the German invasion began some years ago with the spread throughout the United Kingdom of 40,000 or 50,000 reservists in civilian employment. Their job in time of war will be to cut our railroads and telegraphs. The next move will be to burn our mobilization stores and the third move to sink tramp steamers loaded with Portland cement across our naval fairways. Next will come the landing of about 50,000 men on the East Coast. So the, the idea develops that there's an army already in Britain of a very large number, probably some thousands, of trained German reservists. There's a hidden military army that's already here. Now what that means is that you're not simply looking forward to the possibility of invasion. The invasion has already started because they're already here and they're already planning to blow things up. And this becomes firmly believed, not only um, in fiction, but very solidly in um, official views of what's likely to happen. Now, we just... If this hidden army is going to blow things up, if they're going to blow up uh, railway, railways and um, telegraph lines and telephone lines and all sorts of other things. What can the defenders do about it? Well, in March 1909, the Secretary of State for War, War tells the House of Commons about a forthcoming military experiment, as it's called. The idea is that the German army has landed at Hastings, uh, obviously it uh, um, had been used before for landings, landing at Hastings, and that resident German agents had blown up the railway lines, uh, the bridges and tunnels, forcing the defenders onto the roads. And so the idea was that a 1,000 troops had to be brought from London by car. And so 300 cars were organized. And this is a, a photograph of the cars arriving in Hastings. 300 cars are organized to take the troops to Hastings. And this is obviously very well publicized, gets um, a, a lot of attention. Here are the same troops marching through Hastings when they've got out of their cars. But this whole operation is based on the idea that there has already been sabotage. And the idea that there's been sabotage is based on the idea that there are spies, there are sabotage agents already in Britain. So there's this very strong endorsement of the idea of saboteurs being already in place. And almost immediately after, in April 1909, comes something called the Yorkshire Motor Transport Experiment. This is based on the idea that the Germans have landed at Scarborough and that it's necessary to bring troops over from Leeds by car. So in April 1909, 124 cars belonging to the Yorkshire Automobile Club set off from, from Leeds and bring 500 soldiers. As the cars leave Leeds, of course, they're saluted by a troop of Boy Scouts. 
And when they reached Malton, the streets were crowded, flags fluttered from scores of windows, school children carried Union Jacks and waved them lustily. And they finally met the troops pretending to be invaders just outside Seema at Stony Hags. And there is the Battle of Stony Hags on the 24th of April, 1909. Now, the map here, let's see if I can do something quite... Oh, yeah, there we go. There's the railway, Seema Railway Station. This is the road to Scarborough. And here is uh, Stony Hags. This is where the battle is fought. Okay, interesting. So in April 1909, um, the Leeds defenders are victorious, and they drive on to Scarborough. They go round the marine, drive onto the seafront. They're met by the mayor. Various restaurants were patronized, says the, says the local paper, and it was not long before the men were out again, riding on donkeys across the sands, playing football, and smiling upon the girls, while the officers had lunch at the Grand Hotel. So it was, it was quite a day out. But it's a, very, it's a very specific official statement that there is a danger from invasion at Scarborough, and also that there are German spies around who, in this case, have blown up, the, um, blown up the railway bridges, making it necessary to come by car. Critics for, for all these exercises said, well, why hadn't the German spies blown up the roads as well? But there was kind of a bit of huffing and puffing about that. And... Now, MI5, the decision to create MI5, was taken four days after the uh, Yorkshire Motor Transport Experiment. So the decision to create this organization dedicated to counter-espionage is taken within this whole context of invasion um, rather than any particular fear of, German, of uh, actual German spies. I should say it's not called MI5 until the First World War, but it goes through such a strange series of of, of constantly changing names that I think it's probably easiest if we think of it and refer to it as MI5 throughout the whole period. Its head is, um, why is that doing that? Okay. Its head is this man, Vernon Kell. And here's another picture of, of Kell, this is Kell looking um, quite pleased with himself on Armistice Day, um, 11th of November 1918, uh, celebrating the defeat of Germany when all the staff of MI5 went up onto the roof and they were all photographed. So here's Kell. So Kell starts work at uh, the end of in October 1909 and he's soon collaborating with chief constables on schemes to frustrate what is believed to be the German plan of uh, sabotage in advance of invasion. The first thing that's done is to prepare to guard vulnerable points, because obviously if the Germans are going to blow these vulnerable points up, you have to think of a way of guarding them. So MI5 and local chief constables start working on identifying vulnerable points and how to, to guard them. The War Office also starts um, working with chief constables on evacuation plans because the belief at the war office is that the invading German army is going to try to live off the land. So the best thing to do is to deny them livestock and horses and carriages. And so from July 1909, coastal chief constables, or chief constables in coastal areas, including north, the North Riding, began drawing up evacuation schemes for use in invasion. The, the chief constable of the North Riding is a man called Major Robert Bauer. And Bauer was a military officer who'd become chief constable in 1898 and would serve until his death in 1929. So he's chief constable throughout this period. And the evacuation plans drawn up by chief constables such as Bauer were incredibly detailed. They, by the First World War, they included not only evacuation maps of how people and livestock and carts were to be moved out, but they had proclamations that were to be posted, requisition documents, all the things that were needed to remove or disable the things that were of use to an invader. 
Another thing that Kell was asked to do when he became head of MI5 was to look at the possibility of stay-behind agents. The idea was that if the German army invaded, you were going to need to know what the army, what the, what the invaders were doing. And so you had to recruit people who would stay behind and report from, as it was said, within the enemy's lines in time of war. And in, in 1910, Kell notes in his diary that he's got in touch with the intelligence officer who's working on the northeast coast defenses. He appears to have got in touch with a number of people along the east coast as far south as Whitby, who might be very useful to us someday. And in the following year, 1911, the North Riding Chief Constable, Major Bauer, assures the Home Office that his senior officers were working on lists of local people who would be likely to act as observers and informers in rear of the enemy's lines in case of a successful, successful hostile landing. The idea being that these observers should remain in rear of the enemy's lines and get information of the enemy's movements through to our own troops. So in the North Riding and presumably around Scarborough, they were identifying people who would serve as these observers in a secret network after the invasion, who would carry reports of what the Germans were doing to the British defenders. I don't know if there's any information surviving about who these were or if they were, if they were ever approached, but I, I suspect there may well be some clues in the archive. But the big operation and the most significant thing that MI5 was doing before the, before the war was to compile lists of suspects. And um, in 1910, MI5 sent a, a return of aliens form to chief constables that they had to send back. And by 1911, had an index of 4,500 people. MI5 noted that the North Riding chief constable had sent in some reports on possible suspects, the first to come in. So, Bauer was obviously very keen to be involved in listing resident foreigners who were considered to be suspicious. By September 1911, Bauer reported that his superintendents had spent the last few months working on four separate anti-invasion projects. So the police were obviously very busy in the North Riding on anti-invasion work. He compiled lists of farmers and local landowners who were willing to supervise the removal of transport uh, after a German invasion. He got lists of observers who could be approached to report from behind the German lines. He got lists of former servicemen who could uh, guard vulnerable points. And he got lists of all aliens, as they called them, resident foreigners, and he was sending reports on any arrivals, departures, or changes of address at once to Captain Kell. Now, this sort of work is going on throughout the country, and um, there's a, an enormous project to list uh, foreign residents. By 1913, MI5 had managed to get access to the 1911 census that was supposed to be secret, but they'd been given privileged access so that they could continue their listing. And by 1913, they'd listed 29,000 foreign residents. They had a huge archive in London of suspicious, supposedly suspicious foreigners, including 11,000 Germans and Austrians, um, principally adult men because they wanted uh, to, to list potential reservists who were living in coastal counties. And from these 11,000 names, they put together what they call the special war list. A special war list was particular suspects who they thought might be deeply involved in uh, sabotage when the Germans landed. And the special war list is divided into three sections. One of them is the people who are definitely to be arrested, the second is people who are to be searched they, and their premises searched and anybody found there. And the other category is people who are simply to be watched. Now the entire special war list is more than 200 people by, by the outbreak of war. So MI5 has identified from its list of, of 11,000 Germans and Austrians more than 200 people who had to be closely watched because they're thought to be part of this hidden army. And 
the uh, chief constables are supposed to send in quarterly reports on these people to MI5. So again, there's a great deal of work being done in the, um, in the coastal counties watching these suspects. And I have to reiterate, there is no German invasion. There is no hidden army to be found. These 11,000 um, German and Austrian men are innocent of any, of any planning for invasion. There are a very small number of German naval agents, more you'd think of them probably more as correspondents, who are sending reports to Berlin about things that they pick up in, in coastal towns and in coastal ports. But there is nothing, there is no military operation which MI5 is very closely involved with. Now, the special war list survives. So we can look at the suspects in the North Riding, and because we now have access to the 1911 census and we have access to local newspapers digitized, we can see exactly who these people are. So I've, I've sorted out the half dozen um, uh, particular suspects from the special war list in the North Riding, so we can just have a quick look at them. They each have a, a code number, and they go up to North Riding 335. And so we know that there were some hundreds of foreign residents in the North Riding being reported on every quarter by the local police to MI5 in London. So here are a couple of um, extracts. So who are these people? Now, they're, the, the first one at the top here is this, this guy called Johnson Boak. Uh, and he's North Riding 63. And he's, as you see next to his name, it says G. That means he's German. So they're watching this guy, Johnson Boak. And down at the bottom here is Carl Cook G. He's German as well. North Riding 248. So what do we know about these people? Well, Johnson Boak was British. He'd been born in Driffield. His parents were both British. His father had been born in Scarborough. He wasn't German. There's no indication why he was on the special war list. And as you can see, it was canceled in 1912. What about Carl Cook? Carl Cook was a British mechanical engineer. He'd been born in North Ormsby in 1874. He's not German. He had German parents, but he wasn't German himself. So let's go to the, let's go to the next one. Here we have William Dingles, German. George Dingles was British. He was an iron molder born in Stockton. There's no indication why he's listed, except he had German parents. Bertrand Harvent, North Riding number 77, German. Well, he's not German. He's a British accountant. He's born in France, but he got, had British citizenship through his parents. And it says cancelled 1914, presumably because it was realized the information was completely wrong. Now, this isn't a very good start. You can see a theme developing here. Men who are not German are being listed as German. The question is why? Well... Britain followed something called the jus soli, or the right of soil. Now, that meant the tradition was to give British citizenship to anyone who was born here. The Germans followed something called the jus sanguinis, which is the right of blood. In other words, a child born anywhere in the world to German parents could claim German citizenship. So what's going on here is that Kell and the local police are looking at these people who have German parents and are deciding they cannot be trusted because they have the ability to claim German citizenship. Of course, none of them do claim German citizenship. You can see in the census that they're listing themselves as British. But MI5, in this period and right into the First World War, has this almost mystical idea of German blood as a, as a taint which uh, means that people can't be trusted. So, bizarrely, these people are being listed as German who are not German at all, which makes you wonder about how many of the 11,000 
people who are supposed to be German and Austrian are actually German and Austrian. So let's look again. Here we have this guy, German, Casper. Well, Casper is German. He's born in Germany. He's a teacher of languages. And obviously, he's cancelled in 1913 because he goes home. Well, Adolphus Lauer, again, North Riding 157. Lauer was a hotel manager who'd been born in Germany, but he claimed British citizenship by parentage. He had an English wife, four children born in England, which again possibly contributes to his entry being marked as cancelled by 1914. Uh, here we've got uh, Julius Muller. He's a foreign correspondent in the iron and steel industry. He's gen genuinely German, but I've no idea why he's listed. He was, he's not down to be searched. He's not down to be arrested. And as far as I can tell, um, he had absolutely no connection with, with Secret Service. Ernest Newman was again German. Again, he's a foreign correspondent in the iron industry. He's married to a British woman and has two British children, so there's no indication of why on earth he should be on the list. And we have Albert Schwenk. This seems to be a mistake. I can't find any Albert Schwenk at that address. Um, there's a guy, an elderly German language teacher called Friedrich Schwenk at that address. It seems that this is a mistake, and that raises another interesting question. There are lots of mistakes in the, in the special war list as it survives. Now, the last two, Hugo Spiegelhalter, Flowergate in Whitby, and Ludwig Wolf, Flowergate in Whitby. Again, Spiegelhalter is uh, a well-known jeweler in Whitby. He's British. He's listed as a German, but he's British. He was born in Bradford. His parents were German. They'd lived in Bradford for a very long time. His father was naturalized. Uh, Hugo had a British wife and two sons, but MI5 decides that he's German, which he isn't, and they also give a German spelling of his surname, which is a wonderful extra piece of prejudice. And then Ludwig Wolf, who again didn't spell his name like that, he spelled it without an E. He was naturalized British, he was a hairdresser on Flowergate in Whitby. He'd been naturalized since 1880, so he'd been naturalized for 34 years by the outbreak of war. He had a British wife and three British children. So there's something very strange going on here. There's a great deal of prejudice. None of these were German spies. Most weren't even German. And yet they were the most suspicious out of hundreds of people in the North Riding who were being monitored and watched by MI5 and the police. None of them was ever preceded against. And listing them was, it seems, an act of, of sheer prejudice. Now, I want to, I think, but um, time to, to, to just look at the outbreak of war. Um, as war approached in July 1914, on the, the 30th of July, the police war circular was sent to chief constables, warning them of Im imminent attacks on vital points by, quote, small bands of men provided with explosives who would attempt to delay mobilization or military preparation. So the police are warned that um, invasion is likely to be coming. Vernon Kell moves into his office where he sleeps on a, a camp bed with a lot of telephones around, obviously waiting for the calls that are going to come in about the, the attacks. Nothing, nothing arrives. But on the 4th of August, 1914, MI5's given advance notice of the declaration of war, and chief constables are sent a prearranged code telegram which is, instructs them to arrest or watch the suspects on the special war list. Now, Kell's arrest list by the outbreak of war has 22 names. So these are the people that he considers out of the 11,000 he's listed are those who must definitely be um, German agents. But seven of those on his arrest list, um, most histories of MI5 mention the, the arrest list of 22 names, but seven of those on the arrest list are known to be living abroad. Now, they can only 
be arrested in this country if they come over with an invasion. These are known uh, directors of German intelligence who are in Germany or in um, neutral countries. And the idea that Kell can order the arrest of these 22 people um, is, is quite wrong. Another five, again, weren't at the ad ad addresses listed when the police went, so rather like the mistake we saw in the North Riding. The head of the special branch admitted the operation resulted in the arrest of only nine or ten of the known spies, uh, most, of, most of whom were, as I say, the, the German agents who were reporting on naval affairs. On the, there was an agent in Hull, for instance, who reported on mine sweeping before the war and on minefields. He sent in uh, a plan of, of the docks at Immingham. He sent a report which he got uh, commended for about the, German, about the British naval manoeuvres. So that's the sort of information that was being sent. But none of these agents had been expected to continue reporting after the outbreak of war. And they were really quite minor agents. Kell then decided that because the, um, because the arrests and searches on the outbreak of war hadn't revealed this great military organization that he still believed existed, he ordered all those on the watch list to be searched as well. And so there must have been a lot of police raids all over the country, including in the North Riding. Um, police raids at, uh, on the outbreak of war, looking for potential spies. But of course, nothing, nothing was found. Now, the guarding of vulnerable points on the outbreak of war had begun with the issue of the police war circular on the 29th of July before the outbreak of war. And it was based on the complete fantasy of this army of saboteurs that was going to blow things up. Armed regular soldiers and territorials were posted at the most important structures on the lines to be used by troop trains. And three days after they were posted, they became the first British soldiers to fire shots in anger during the war, when nervous sentries at Western Supermare shot and injured a man who was too deaf to hear the challenge. A war was declared on the 4th of August, and six days later, a sentry on the railway near Red Hill was shot and injured by a colleague. The following day, a sentry near Birkenhead was shot dead during the chase after an imagined spy, while the sentry guarding a canal bridge near Liverpool shot and killed a man, obviously convinced that he was a, a German saboteur. On the 18th of August, in, in a really horrific incident, a young man at Felixstowe was first shot and then bayoneted to death by a terrified sentry, and two days later, soldiers on guard in Saltburn and Aldershot both shot and killed men who'd failed to answer their challenge. The young man at Aldershot was shot in the back by a soldier who didn't realize that he was deaf. The Daily Express advised the deaf not even to wait for a challenge, but to hold up their hands the moment they see a sentry. So this takes me back to the, the plaque at the beginning of the talk. These were the first British troops to be shot in the war. These were the first British civilians to be killed in the war. But they've dropped out of history. I think they've dropped out of history because they were, the troops were killing each other and the, the, the civilians were shot by British soldiers. But I don't really think they should fall out of the history of the war. Um, I think they were casualties of the war and they demand a, a, a memorial somewhere. And it's very interesting that in the opening weeks of the war, the British are shooting more civilians than they are arresting German spies, um, despite MI5's efforts in the, in the, the pre-war years. And they were killed because of this fantasy that MI5 had been spreading for five years. And um, at the same time, let's have a look. Oh, yes, I should. These are, this is a photograph of um, arrests on the outbreak of war. At the same time, 
On the 5th of August, the Aliens Restriction Act is passed, enabling the police to remove enemy nationals from areas of potential um, invasion deem deemed prohibited areas. And the whole of the East Coast becomes a prohibited area. And that's why uh, a lot of Germans disappear from the Northeast Coast. They would have been removed from the prohibited area, which included Scarborough. The police focused on removing German reservists and all suspicious foreigners who, quote, have resided sufficiently long within the prohibited area to be well acquainted with the nature of re its resources, in other words, to help uh, an invader. No further action before the war had been contemplated against resident uh, foreigners, but MI5 was very concerned about the threat of invasion, about the threat of sabotage. And so on the 7th of August, so that's uh, the third day of war, it persuaded the, home, the War Office to order the arrest and internment of all resident German and Austrian men of military age, in other words, the reservists who might be planning to um, carry out sabotage. That was really unexpected and um, mistaken, firstly because there was nowhere to put them, there, was just, there were no camps in which to put them, and secondly, bizarrely, at that point we weren't actually at war with Austria, and so we couldn't simply award, order the arrest of Austrian men. So that, it, was, it was countermanded, but it was soon reinstated, and so by the 20th of September, 10,500 German and Austrian men had been interned. Uh, at which point the arrests had to be suspended again because the camps were full. This is something which isn't often talked about. Oh, yes, this, this photograph shows the arrest of um, German and Austrian men of, of military age, although at the bottom of this postcard, which is uh, a British postcard, but it's designed for sale in France, it says that these are German spies arrested at Wilsdon, um, which they aren't. They're simply um, German men being interned under the a hastily passed Aliens Restriction Act. Something that's not really focused on a great deal is the complete destruction of the German colony in Britain um, during the opening years of the, the First World War. These 50,000 men and 25,000 women who largely regarded Britain as their home um, Within three years of the outbreak of war, 30,000 German and Austrian men had been interned and 21,000 men and women had been deported. This is a huge operation which doesn't get, get much written about. And none of these people were, were any threat and the fears that led to their, um, to their arrest and internment had their basis in this uh, groundless fear of German invasion. At the same time, the operation, the intelligence operation for Stay Behind Spies was actually put um, into effect. On the first day of war, the 5th of August 1914, the observer scheme went into operation in the eastern counties, initially in the, south, in the, in the east and southeast. Regional intelligence officers were appointed and they, in turn, uh, recruited the observers and chief observers who'd been identified before the war, and they made contact with local police and military commanders. In September 1914, Northern Command was given uh, money to extend this network into its own area, at which point the stay-behind agents would have been recruited and appointed for the North Riding. So on the outbreak of war, there was an intelligence operation set up, there was a network set up along the East Coast as far up as the North Riding to deal with uh, a German invasion. And again, I'd be fascinated to know whether any information about who was in this network uh, survives in the, um, in the local archives of, of any of the police forces on the, on the East and Northeast Coast. And these uh, uh, observers and chief observers weren't idle while they were waiting for the German invader, but they were used to monitor resident foreigners and also any naturalized British. So they would have gone after the people on the special war list on the grounds that in the event of a German attack, they were capable of obtaining information and passing it to their information depots 
for transmission to the opposing forces. That, that includes uh, several levels of fantasy. Firstly, that the Germans are going to invade. Secondly, that there are things called information depots and that they're serviced by German spies. So the, 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 the fantasy is quite deep and at many different levels. So, what's going on in Scarborough? Well, there are a lot of defences put up. This is a map of the, the defences, a plan of the defences in, in Scarborough, uh, principally against invasion. You may have seen this already, which is a famous photograph of the sandbag barrier at the end of Eastborough to, to stop troops um, marching into town. And here also, here is the, um, the barbed wire entanglement at the bottom end of Bland's Cliff. So the idea of, um, the idea of uh, German invasion is not coming into the minds of people in Scarborough by the time of the bombardment simply through fantasy and spy fever, which people often, historians often write about. But there is a great deal of official activity which is um, in preparation for invasion, which a lot of people must have known about. I don't think that it's possible to, to have carried out this kind of survey, um, to have carried out, made these sorts of preparations in the North Riding without a lot of people becoming known uh, what was going on and also realising that there were these levels of fear which were... Um, officially held. So the, the 16th of December raid brings um, certainly death and, and, and hardship to the, to the northeast coast. But again, I think it's worth remembering what um, an impact it was having on the German colony in Britain. According to an American journalist in London writing soon after the raid, the official reaction to the Scarborough raid brought even greater suffering to German civilians in England. With renewed vigor, they are now being hunted, trapped, arrested, thrown into jail, herded in concentration camps. Following the shelling of Scarborough, Whitby and Hartlepool, this big spy hunt has become more like a rabbit drive in its ruthless rounding up of thousands of harmless and helpless Germans. And there are also reports of um, of, of suicides among uh, some of the, the Germans who are forced into internment. And also, um, there's one particularly grim episode where the uh, newly interned Germans um, protest against the quality of food that they're being given. And again, their very nervous guards fire into the crowd and kill five people. So I think all these deaths have to be put back into the, into the history of the First World War as being not only regrettable, but also avoidable. So, to go back to the Scarborough Raid, um, it came at the end of five years of secret preparations by MI5 and chief constables for a German invasion that never came, um, the fear of invasion that existed in December 1914 and sent people flooding uh, into inland from Scarborough is often blamed on public hysteria, but it was a hysteria underpinned by official warnings and by official fantasies. The women in night dresses, who I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, passing through SEMA, would have remembered the 1909 Battle of Stony Hags, that imaginary battle just outside the village, um, which military and civic officials had assured them could happen. And MI5 had led the police and the military in these fears and in a huge operation that really, by, by nothing more than prejudice, had seen the listing of 29,000 foreign residents before the war and the construction of this special war list of supposed um, uh, enemy agents, which really had involved the demonization of, of 200 uh, innocent citizens, based around this almost uh, mythical idea of German blood. 
So, that's the story of um, the fear of invasion that leads up to, to the Scarborough Raid. And I have to say that all these prejudices on the part of MI5 did continue into the war. Um, and MI5 became involved in all sorts of um, rather strange bits of, of domestic policing. But um, I think that story will have to wait for another talk. Thank you very much. Well, it's interesting that I, I perhaps should have mentioned that in the decade before the First World War, there were several official inquiries at a very high level in government into the possibility of invasion. And the, the chance of German invasion was ruled out time and time again. And every time the Royal Navy said, well, you know, we can, we can protect the country, we can stop them from, from crossing the North Sea, the War Office would come up with another possibility, you know, what if the fleet was lured away somewhere? Um, well, no, we think we can probably do Well, what if all the communication lines from the East Coast were blown up by resident agents so you didn't know they'd landed for 24 hours? So it's really, um, the government keeps coming back and saying, no, we've looked into this and it's not possible for, for Germany to invade because of the strength of the Royal Navy, but the War Office keeps coming back with other possibilities. So eventually, by the First World War, the War Office has been told they can't plan for an invasion. The Germans aren't going to try to take over the country, turn it into a German province. They've been told they can plan for an almost suicidal descent of up to 70,000 troops on the East Coast, followed by a forced march on London, to, to knock out um, Whitehall um, in order to force the government to surrender. So there was a great deal of confidence in the Royal Navy everywhere except the War Office. And there was a kind of zero-sum game. It was felt that if the, if, the, if the Admiralty got more money, that meant there was less money for the War Office. So the War Office had to kind of fight its corner. But all this planning, official planning, does go against the background of the War Office constantly being told that invasion just isn't possible because of the Royal Navy. Was there any comparable activity within German society? Um, there was certainly fear of spies, uh, but it's interesting that even though British civilians were, in, for instance, interned in Germany during the First World War. It was in retaliation for what the British had done. There wasn't any plan in Germany to intern British civilians uh, at the outbreak of war. And it was done because MI5 had pressed for the uh, internment of German civilians in Britain. There were very many fewer British citizens living in Germany, so it made it a slightly different problem. But um, there, were, there were fears of, of spies across all Western nations, and certainly a lot of the uh, ideas that MI5 had were derived from fears that the French had of the Germans in particular. Um, and something I didn't mention, but is, is quite interesting, is that the French became convinced that the Germans were funding, before the war, were funding trades unions to cause strikes. Now, in 1911, there's, there's a big, uh, there's a coal strike. In 1912, in Britain, there is a big railway strike. And it's realized that, a, that transport strikes like these will hold up the coaling ships that take Welsh coal to the Royal Navy and they will stop the British Army from uh, sending troops to fight the invaders by rail. 
And so, in fact, funding the trades unions is as effective sabotage as blowing up the railways or the mines. And so MI5 and the Special Branch do actually become fascinated before the First World War with the idea that the Germans are funding industrial unrest. And they actually become convinced that the Germans may well be funding the suffragettes. Anything that seems to be causing disorder in a, in a society that other be, otherwise be orderly gets blamed on the Germans. And this is definitely believed in, um, in the cabinet. Winston Churchill becomes a firm believer in German funding. During the um, August 1912 rail strike, he tells his cabinet colleagues that the Germans are behind it. And when he, because he's Home Secretary at the time, Churchill has a meeting with one of the, the union leaders at the Home Office, and the union leader remembers later being called into Churchill's office, into his private office before the meeting. And Churchill goes, opens the door, looks out, closes it, opens another door, looks out, closes it, comes to the trades union leader and says, tell me, is the German gold behind this? And the trades union leader is taken aback, and you know, of course there isn't. But this is, this is a, a fantasy which comes to Britain from France, where yes, there are, there are, there are similar fears of, of what's being done. Well, by the time of the bombardment, they might well have been interned, or they could have, if they were, if they were German uh, civilians, if they were German nationals, then under the Aliens, Alien Restrictions Act, they could be forcibly removed from coastal areas anyway. So they could have been told to go and live elsewhere, even if they were, they were not interned. But I do remember somebody I interviewed, I remember she said, she didn't believe that there were, there were spies, but um, she said it was very strange, though, because before the war in Scarborough, there'd been lots of German bands. And when war was declared, she said, they all disappeared just like that. And I thought, well, yeah, they'd all been interned. You know, it was, it was um, not that they were spies, it's because they were, they were thought to be spies and they were, they were forcibly removed and, and uh, imprisoned. You, you mean in Germany? Yes, in Germany, yes. Um, well, I suppose the principal difference between German society and British society would be uh, conscription, so that the, the German civilians were military, militarily trained, and so that would be their, their principal preparation. But um, I'm not aware of any. It's, um, no, it's not something, not something I know about. But to go, to go back to this question of, of um, waiters, waiters were an absolute fascination for, I was going to say, a fascination for um, the writers of invasion fiction. In fact, several invasion novels have organ military organizations of German waiters. Um, they feature them. And there were... The German colony in Britain it organized itself into lots of uh, different clubs and societies. It was a big feature of the expatriate Germans in Britain. And so there were kind of fellowship societies of, of waiters that had thousands of members. 
And before the First World War, MI5 had two undercover agents. They had a, a Belgian and a, and a German who were recruited specifically, in the case of the Belgian, to, to go and investigate the society, societies of Germans, particularly in London. And these included things like um, German cycling clubs. And uh, Vernon Kell was convinced that the German cycling clubs were organized for military action on the outbreak of war and were going to provide the, um, they were going to provide the guides to the invading German army. And so the cycling clubs were intensively investigated, but of course it was a total fantasy. But there's an enormous amount of work that's done in Britain before the First World War to do with invasion, which I don't think has been written about. For example, the British defenders were going to have to prepare to fight the German invader. They weren't going to fight them on the coast, they were going to fight them inland. The idea was, by the outbreak of war, that the Germans would land. You'd ha there were no defences on the east coast, apart from a few guns um, in, odd, in odd places. And so they were going to have to be allowed to land and march towards London. And we would have to fight them somewhere to the east of Cambridge. And so the whole area to the, to, that the British Army was going to concentrate in was surveyed by British officers, down to the level of working out which towns particular British units would go to and in which hotels and schools they would be uh, housed. So you can, you can see the plans that exist for exactly where, you know, in Bury St Edmunds, they're going to... Um, going to put the cavalry and in which hotels the officers are going to go. There was such a, a, there was such a conviction that invasion was going to happen that, uh, that down to the level of um, you know, uh, where the headquarters of the British First Defence Army was going to uh, you know, have its meals. With those other specialists, um, was the surveillance of them entirely covert or was anybody aware of that they were on the list as well? Uh, it, it was in, entirely covert. The difference between, I mean, the, the, the special branch of the Metropolitan Police, which was the, the equivalent civilian unit, used a completely different method of policing. It was quite happy for people to know that they were watched because it regarded that, particularly, say, with anarchists in London, letting them know that they were being watched was an important part of policing. But MI5 had an entirely different approach, um, which was to, to do this completely in, in secret. Um, which of course meant that, uh, and of course very few cases were brought, certainly none against the people who were thought to be acting as military agents. So they never had to present any evidence in court about all of this stuff, which would challenge their ideas um, in any way. And th which was another problem of their investigating the German colony because the way that it was done essentially was the same way that uh, policing was, was done by the, by the special branch. The special branch had informers uh, in criminal uh, communities in London, who, but they knew what they were looking for. They knew the crimes that were being committed and um, they knew what the special branch officers wanted to know. But there were no crimes being committed here. These were all imaginary. And so the, the undercover agents who were sent into the German community to investigate them had to be told exactly what they were looking for because uh, they had to be told, you know, go and investigate whether this particular club is being used to coordinate all the German reservists in Britain so that they can be coordinated to do sabotage on the outbreak of war. And so the agents came back and said, yes, <laughs> that's exactly what's happening. <laughs> so there were the very few checks and balances. Um, and I, I should say there's one peculiar thing, which is, of course, what happens to all this fantasy when it's proved to be false? Well, there are two things that happen. One of them is MI5 says, we did it. By getting all of them interned, we disrupted this whole operation. There was an enormous military preparation, but we stopped it by interning them all. And of course, you can't investigate that at all. You can't prove that it's, it's right or wrong. 
But the other thing that MI5 does is it says, can this pre, is, does any of this pre-war organization survive? Is it possible that it's still there waiting to be activated in wartime? And one thing that they do during the First World War is they start thinking, when there's a big coal strike among miners in South Wales in 1915, immediately, is it German funded? And the idea of German gold as the way in which German sabotage continues into the First World War, German gold becomes the fantasy during the First World War, up on the Clyde, the, the, the Clyde strikes in 1915, 1916, um, as I say, in South Wales. The idea is that the Germans are funding industrial unrest, which, again, distorts the government's attitude to, to protest and unrest. Um, pacifists must be funded by Germany. The No Conscription Fellowship must be getting money from Germany. So...